If you've been listening to the Business of Biotech with any regularity, you know that we like to frame up our conversations by getting a sense of our guests' career intentions and aspirations by sort of mapping out their experiences, starting with academia and moving along through their industry journey. So the chronology of a life science exec's career path usually tells us a pretty clear story, but every now and then we come across uh, Pavan Cherivu. Dr. Cherivu is one of those execs whose academic studies and industry experiences are so diverse, it's not really safe to make any assumptions. So we're honored that he's with us today to walk through his path to the CEO's chair at Cyogene Therapies and to share the important work he's doing there in AAV and lengthy viral gene therapy development. Dr. Cherivu, welcome to the show. We're honored to have you and thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much for the invitation uh, and it's great to be here. Um, you know, I, I think as, as I look back on my journey, it's it's been a really diverse uh, set of experiences that led me to Cyogene Therapies. I uh, couldn't be more excited about, you know, our mission and what we're trying to do, which is to apply cutting edge science in the field of gene therapies uh, to really help improve the lives of uh, children with rare diseases, uh, but also tackle uh, much broader problems. And, and we see this as the future of the gene therapy field uh, to begin to extend the reach of genetic medicine to large areas of unmet need, uh, like Parkinson's disease, where you know one day we hope gene therapy can be used to uh, deliver the kind of payload, the kind of genetic material that can really help improve the quality of lives of these patients. Uh, and something that we're uh, dedicated to doing is making sure that we have as uh, robust a platform developed in-house uh, to achieve that ambitious mission and hopefully help shape the future of what gene therapies is, is all about. Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna dig into that uh, into some of the detail there around how SIO is going about that. Um, just as soon as as I said, we uh, we figure out what exactly you were thinking through your, through your academic experiences and onto your professional life. Uh, also, real quick, joining me uh, today uh, on today's episode to learn about Dr. Cherivu and SIO is my friend, colleague, and frequent co-host Aaron Harris, chief editor over at Cell and Gene. Aaron, it's always great to have you. Thanks, Matt. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Cheru, I want I want to learn a little bit more about you by way of your career path. So, I'm just going to run through uh, a, a brief little uh, little background or your academic chops. You know, starting with your uh, they're, they're complex, they're diverse. Start, starting out with this Duke undergrad in biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, and chemistry. Uh, moving into an MSc, uh, a Master's of Computer Science from Oxford University, a Health Sciences Technology degree from MIT, and a Harvard Medical School MD. So when I look at that, you know, before we jump into industry, I look at that and I go, okay, so here's a guy who wanted to build a platform from which he could jump into virtually any biotech role of his choosing, right? I mean, from IT, high tech, you know, MSc to, uh, to MD. But then you, you you jump into industry and you uh, you exercise your expertise in management consulting. I, I think it was at McKinsey. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Right. So McKinsey Management Consulting. Then you practice internal medicine for a while before taking on leadership roles with biopharma companies. So it makes me curious what what the, what the, what the plan was coming out of your academic training. What was your mo in terms of you know here's what I'm going to do with all this diverse, you know, high caliber training that I've received. <laughs> well, you know, I'm humbled to hear you say that. I, I think, you know, my journey, as I said, has been pretty diverse. I've, I've been in a lot of different places uh, academically and professionally uh, that led me to where I am today. But, uh, you know, I, I think we all approach, you know, our career path, I think, with a great deal of uncertainty. And at the outset, you have very little idea of where you might end up one day. And that was certainly the case, you know, with my own path. Uh, but it might make sense to rewind the clock to, you know, the very beginning and, and my upbringing, because I think it, it really has been a, a force, my, my mom and dad's influence in mm. helping me choose my path and the kinds of projects and questions that I wanted to tackle, you know, down the road. Um, so my dad was a, a civil engineer, my mom, a family physician. I grew up in Tampa, Florida. And I think that dual influence is what really got me excited at a really young age with uh, both building things and, uh, and, and the fun and the joy of that, uh, but also working on problems that might impact the betterment of society in some way. And 
uh, you know, I think um, uh, some of my earliest memories are of taking apart, you know, transistor radios. Uh, my dad had this old TRS-80, like a clunky computer at home that I would take apart, you know, the, the cathode ray that, that was behind it, the floppy disk drive. And, it, you know, there was, there was an element of learning with that for sure, but there was also this sort of fun and mischief associated with it that, you know, I, I was a tinkerer growing up and, and you know, and a nerd. And, and I think that, um, it, you know, really gave me a lot of joy uh, early on. I didn't really think about, you know, science and physics and biology as necessarily being the path I would go down, but something I knew I'd love to do was, was build things. And, and I love to think about ideas that could one day perhaps help people uh, and a lot of that uh, motive, that humanitarian motivation, if you will, came from my mom, who's a family practice physician, but you know, in her spare time, would work with local communities, uh, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, and really try to make a difference in in their lives with sort of pro bono care. Um, and so when I went to college, uh, you know, I I knew right away. I was I was one of those people who you know, walking in the door day one as a freshman, I knew I wanted to be. A biomedical engineer, which is sort of a strange thing to say, uh, looking back on it or reflecting on it, but um, but I think those dual impulses, you know, very early on helped shape me, and it, that was an era in which um, medical device technology was really taking off. So I spent a lot of my time at Duke uh, in research labs. Uh, I worked with Pat Wolf. I worked with Ashutosh Chilcote, who've made you know these seminal contributions to uh, both medical devices and biomaterials, respectively. Uh, but the perspective that I got, you know, at Duke was just the fun of it all and, and being able to maybe contribute to problems that could have a real impact. So, you know, at that time, uh, when you thought about uh, cardiac devices, so defibrillators in particular, um, you know, there was really only one way to shock a person out of an abnormal heart rhythm, and that was to deliver hundreds of joules to their heart all at once. And you can imagine the impact that would have on somebody. You, you know, it would often knock them on their back. And for years thereafter, people actually would report PTSD from the experience that they would have being defibrillated, even though that was a life-saving event for them. And, and so this was a time of uh, enormous ferment and, and thought around, could we develop more nuanced, more sophisticated ways of moving a heart out of an abnormal rhythm into a healthy, normal rhythm? And, and part of it was listening, right? So developing sensors and electrodes that can actually listen to those abnormal heart rhythms. And then uh, rather than just delivering that big pulse perhaps you know, pace a patient out of the abnormal rhythm. And so that signal processing uh, and uh, combination of kind of circuit boards and electrical uh, uh, circuit design really captivated me uh, at the time. And so uh, I was continuing to do a lot of work uh, in this space. Uh, actually, right after college, I joined a company called Guidant to continue working uh, on medical devices um, and, uh, and, and went on to, uh, to graduate training. I was fortunate enough to, to win a Rhodes Scholarship and at Oxford for a couple of years, uh, studied computer science uh, as my master's program. But again, always trying to apply it back to the field of cardiac devices. And it was around that time that I realized that much of the work that I was doing, while it was uh, scientifically interesting and led to some interesting products and technologies, um, it you know, didn't allow me to see the longitudinal impact of what I was doing on patients. Uh, and that's when I set my sights on going to medical school and becoming a cardiologist. Um, and so, you know, that pivot from engineering to medicine was, was frankly a difficult one. I remember my first year of medical school having to move from a, an engineer's mindset, which is, you know, how do you break down a problem into its logical parts and, you know, one by one try to solve them to one that involved a lot of memorization, a lot of you know, deep understanding of concepts that were really unfamiliar to me at the time. Um, and so I, I joined med, medical school at Harvard. It was this joint program with MIT called the Health Sciences and Technology or HST program, which I think is still around today. Uh, and, and that was a godsend to me because, you know, I could be in my uh, physiology classes in medical school, but at the same time have an opportunity to, uh, you know, cross the river and, and go over to uh, MIT's campus take classes in fluid dynamics and uh, electrical engineering and continue to develop that, that other passion that I had. Mm -hmm. um, I actually took a little bit of time off in the middle of medical school uh, to work with a cardiac device company called InfraredX that was developing uh, new spectroscopic methods of diagnosing vulnerable plaque uh, in coronary arteries. Really good experience for me because you know I hadn't up until that point really seen the business side of things and appreciated how difficult it could be to translate great science into uh, an actual application. And 
you know, I started work uh, with them, uh, you know, roughly 20 years ago. Uh, and, and it's only, you know, recently that their products have actually been able to, to reach the market and help patients. Uh, and, and that sort of life cycle, um, you know, struck a chord with me. It, it made me really appreciate that there's something more to learn here, that it's not enough to simply do great science and even, even take care of patients. Uh, part of my passion would be around um, building sustainable businesses that could help address uh, unmet needs uh, by bringing in the right capital, bringing in the right teams, uh, yeah. and making sure that you know we could pull all those elements together. Um, so, so that's kind of my journey through uh, through med school. Um, thereafter, went on to complete my internal medicine residency training at Johns Hopkins, uh, and and my fellowship training in cardiology at UCSF. Um, and you know, as I was doing this, th- these sorts of ideas were swirling around in my head of you know, uh, how do I translate the work I'm doing in a sustainable way into products that could ultimately reach, you know, thousands or millions of patients. And, uh, and so that's when uh, I, I moved to McKinsey uh, in, in a role in strategy consulting, uh, where uh, for about you know, three years, I was exclusively focused on PMP, their, their pharma and medical products practice, um, working on, on issues of R&D strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know that McKinsey is the best place for one to learn how to run a startup company. Uh, you know, so the business building aspect wasn't something I picked up there, but certainly a really formative experience as I began to think about macro factors, right, that were influencing the success or failure of different biotech companies. And one idea that I, I distinctly remember in that period of my life uh, getting uh, ingrained in my mind was that there was this widening gulf between large pharma on the one hand and small biotech on the other. And, and I'm sure, you know, Matt and, and Aaron, you're, you're very familiar with this concept, but uh, I think it's been pervasive in our industry for a long, long time. Uh, and that's the idea that, you know, so much scientific innovation comes from nimble entrepreneurial biotech companies, often with just a few dozen employees within them, but who are operating at the cutting edge of a given science. And yet when those companies hit, you know, major phase two or phase three milestones, they often have to, uh, you know, succumb, if you will, to an M and A event, which is is often a very good thing. It's a windfall for the, for the founders, but it leads to this this um, uh, discovery engine that largely comes from biotech, uh, as opposed to uh, the internal R and D apparatus of large pharma. On the flip side, you know, many large pharma organizations, while they may not be good at that thing, at advancing innovative science, have become extremely good at operating at scale. Right, having that commercial footprint understanding how to appropriately interact with payers and others um, and, and having economies of scale. So pulling all those elements together that smaller companies really need as they approach commercialization. And so, so the notion in my, you know, that was, that was sort of in my mind at the time uh, was, you know, could there be a hybrid model that married the best of both of these worlds? Um, and, and ultimately uh, that's what led me to, to Roy Vant and to Sion. Yeah. Okay. That's, you covered a lot of ground there, Dr. Cherivo. <laughs> you covered a lot of ground. And for, first, I want to just reflect on, on, on the fact that I'm glad I asked you the question about your, your background because the insight that you provided around sort of the seeds of, of where your, your academic studies and career have, have taken you, um, that's insight that we can't get from a, a LinkedIn profile. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I and I do want to move on to uh, you know your your move to the Vaunts, if you will. I've had uh, Vivek Ramaswamy on the show. Uh, he he is uh, he's he's the leader at the at the the I guess you'd call it the family of of Vaunts, including Roy Vaunt, which is uh, um, where I I believe where you started working with with Vivek. Is that correct? At, at Roy Vaunt or Axel Vaunt or, or or one and then the other. Yeah. So my first uh, exposure to industry came with my initial role at Roy Vant. Uh, Prior to that, uh, of course, I'd had these experiences at, you know, smaller uh, medical device companies, uh, but for short periods of time, and this was in the middle of my medical training, I'd also worked at at McKinsey, uh, you know, for a period of time as well. Um, But I never had direct uh, operational experience. And and that came with my first role um, at Roy Vant. You know, a theme that's been true throughout my career has been trying to really challenge myself by finding incredible people to work with. And uh, and often, you know, these groups of people will be much smarter than I am uh, and and really push the boundaries of my own thinking uh, on a given problem or given topic. And this was definitely the case uh, when I came to Roybat. You know, I I look back on 
some of the elements of the, you know, my academic and professional journey before Roy Vet. And I think about, you know, my experience at Oxford uh, on the Rhodes Scholarship. I think about Harvard Med School. I think about um, my experience at Hopkins and residency training. McKinsey, you know, these are all great places with extraordinary levels of talent. Uh, but something changes when you have an individual or a person who takes uh, a real interest in you and your career. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, meeting Vivek was one of the most, um, uh, you know, important moments in my life uh, in terms of shaping my thinking about the industry, but also giving me opportunities to take uh, what were really concepts in my mind and giving me a platform uh, to, to develop them out, to see if we can actually get to a point where we can develop real products that make a real difference. Um, and so the way in which um, I met Vivek uh, was really fortuitous uh, as it happened. I was on a fellowship uh, many years prior to help you know, fund my training in graduate school. Vivek had been on the same fellowship uh, some years later. Uh, and so there was this uh, alumni database that, you know, that linked both of us and, and had both of our informations on it. And so I um, uh, sent him a cold email. I reached out to him via this database mm. after, um, y- you know, hearing him talk about Royvent. Uh, I think it was a, a YouTube video or something like that, where I heard him talk about this concept. And, and recall, you know, while I was at McKinsey, I was, you know, contemplating this widening gulf, right? The, the idea that there was, uh, you know, ma- major differences between large pharma and biotech and, the, the sort of inherent pattern of, of centralization in R&D could be leading to some inefficiencies, right? And, and those inefficiencies, rather than making uh, uh, more products available to patients and accelerating the pace at which we can bring uh, products and programs forward in clinical development, might actually be having a dampening effect uh, on the industry overall. And so this notion that Vivek was already beginning to think about, uh, you know, these ideas and and beginning to build a business model around combining the best of both of those worlds where you know Roy Vant could act as a central platform and then you could have several nimble entrepreneurial vans, each of which are focused on a specific therapeutic area as a means of catalyzing um, more efficiency, more R&D productivity. Well, that was inherently really appealing to me. And so, you know, I reached out uh, without having known him before, uh, cold email, I, I remember uh, sending it uh, on a Saturday Later that day, uh, I get a response, and um, uh, you know that started a dialogue between the two of us. We had a few phone calls. Uh, I remember flying out to New York to meet uh, Vivek and his team, uh, and immediately falling uh, in love with the organization that was being built. Um, you know, this was a group of uh, of radical thinkers who were willing to question the existing status quo of how R and D is done, and begin to you know invent new concepts of how we might. Uh, both fund and execute R and D, um, and so you know that dialogue and, and those early meetings uh, turned into um, uh, an idea around what role I could play, uh, and I ended up joining the Royvent team uh, just a few months later uh, as uh, chief of staff, working closely with Vivek um, on the formation of the the first several uh, Vants within the Royvent family. Mm-hmm. Um, this was a big step for me, you know, not just professionally but personally as well. Uh, because I had, uh, you know, uh, gotten married. Uh, my, my wife uh, was a, a fellow at Stanford, um, and we had just had a daughter, a young daughter who was born, I think, uh, earlier that year. Um, and so making the move from the Bay Area uh, to New York uh, to embark on this new life was, you know, a, a, a leap for us and, and a great uncertainty for us. Um, and we're so thankful that, you know, all of that has panned out um, in terms of, you know, some great opportunities for me to, to move forward with with SIO today. Dr. Cherivu, I, I have a question for you regarding the challenges that you encountered um, coming into Ag's event. Um, I admit though, I'm still a little starstruck about your academic CV and your and your background. So I'm I'm trying to get myself together with my question set here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just give me a second. Uh, with Ag's event specifically though, um, when you joined or you know how that happened, what were some of the challenges you encountered as you joined the team, you know, as, as that all came about? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and maybe I'll, um, you know, start by describing, you know, what led to my interest in the gene therapy space to begin with. Um, and so, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, Roy Vent was a, an incredible training ground for me in which, 
I, for the first time, had uh, operational uh, experience with helping in the formation uh, and the execution of strategy with several of the very first advance that were created. Uh, and going through that experience, understanding you know, how to recruit um, executive talent for emerging biotech companies, uh, how do you go about uh, uh, ensuring that good and solid uh, development plans are put in place that can really help uh, unlock the value of these programs over time for both patients and for shareholders? And finally, how do you well capitalize these companies um, so that they're positioned for long-run success? These were all early lessons that I gained from my experience at Royvant uh, and my involvement with the first roughly half dozen companies that were formed uh, under the Royvant umbrella. Uh, and Vivek was an incredible mentor uh, to me, um, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit uh, and that um, radical look at how R&D could be reinvented. Uh, those to me were, were major influences uh, and informative. So when I was uh, within Royvant uh, back in, uh, 2017, um, I started to think about new areas in which we could do uh, research and, and hopefully make groundbreaking contributions. Uh, and I was fascinated by the explosive growth that was just beginning within gene and cell therapy. Um, I mean, you see it today uh, fairly obviously. Uh, in 2020, gene therapies and cell therapies are on track for roughly $6 billion in revenue that's projected to grow to $30 billion in revenue by 2030. Today, we have roughly 1,000 uh, clinical trials mm -hmm. going on for cell and gene therapies, and, um, and, and that number is only expected to grow over time with dozens of approvals over the next decade expected as well. Um, and so you know, back in 2017, this was only just beginning, and mm -hmm. uh, you saw uh, that the first approved gene therapy in the U.S., uh, Luxterna from Spark, um, was still about a year away. Uh, and there was a lot of excitement around the early results coming out of, of Exus's program, for example, at the time as well. But what I noticed was, you know, if I thought about the Venn diagram of not only modalities of interest, but also areas in which uh, there was um, remarkable unmet need, uh, CNS really stood apart from many other therapeutic areas for me in that the underlying neurobiology of a variety of CNS disorders was becoming better understood. And so were, would there be a way to use gene therapy to target diseases at their source uh, and hence de-risk uh, products and pipelines built around CNS gene therapy. And so that was the concept uh, at the outset, you know, of building a new kind of company that would exclusively focus on gene therapies for neurological indications, but which would go a step further and help try to shape the future of the field by moving beyond simply rare monogenic diseases and thinking of gene therapy as a delivery method uh, that could be applied much more broadly to even multifactorial conditions. Uh, and this was the crucial insight that led us to uh, create the pipeline that we have today uh, within SIO, where we have products that are more classical AAV-based applications in rare uh, genetic diseases, but we also have uh, Lenti-based uh, approaches in much larger conditions like Parkinson's disease. Um, and so that was the early thesis uh, for the company at the outset. Um, now, as it turned out, in late 2017, uh, Axivant, which was the first company formed within the Royvant family around uh, a molecule called Intepridy in Alzheimer's disease, uh, that trial, that phase three trial, read out in failure in late 2017. And that was followed in early 2018 by the failure of the second molecule in Axivant's pipeline. Um, and so in February of 2018, uh, the board of Accident had invited me to, um, uh, to describe my vision for the future of the company. And this idea of building uh, a new leading gene therapy player in CNS uh, was particularly compelling. And, um, and I ultimately started as CEO uh, about a month later. So, um, you know, it's been about a three-year journey for me uh, since I started um, at Accident. And over the last three years, we've been focused on building those core capabilities, those foundational building blocks that really set us up for long-term success. In my mind, that's building a world-class team. Uh, and so, you know, we have uh, about 50 employees today, uh, but these are professionals with decades of experience in gene and cell therapy development coming from places like Spark and Biogen and Novartis. Our very first uh, hire on the gene therapy side 
was uh, Fraser Wright. He was our first chief technology officer coming uh, from Spark, where he was their founder and CTO. Uh, and he just has a, a storied past within gene therapy manufacturing, um, having uh, led the establishment of the clinical vector core lab um, at a number of institutions. And he's currently at Stanford doing the same. But we also brought on board Guangping Gao as our chief scientific advisor, uh, again, a, a legend within the gene therapy space who developed and characterized uh, some of the first AAV-based capsids, including AAV9, which is one of the most widely used uh, capsids in clinical development today. Um, and, and so pulling this team together uh, was really uh, step number one. Um, step number two for us was establishing um, a foundational pipeline. Uh, and that includes the three that you see today, uh, all of which are now in, in clinical stage, uh, dosing patients and generating data. And the third element was capability building, right? And we spent the last three years uh, not just uh, building the team, but also making sure that behind that we have a robust platform and set of capabilities that eventually uh, gene therapy company. Uh, and that includes the establishment of a lab in North Carolina uh, in which we um, have key aspects of analytical development, assay development, uh, process development being done in-house. Uh, along with uh, our preclinical studies. Um, so, so these aspects of, you know, foundational building blocks have really been our focus over the last three years. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And um, the progression and the, the certainly the, you know, world-class team that you put together uh, is indicative of the, the good work that's going on. But regarding the actual name change to SIO gene therapies, so that happened in Q4 2020, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, so why then the name change and what does SIO actually mean? What does it represent? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I think the, the name change was really the capstone event following a number of uh, key changes uh, to the business, to the, the capital structure, to the shareholder base. Uh, and so, so let me recount a few of those changes over the last um, three years. Uh, first, uh, when I first started as CEO, we had a, a significant amount of debt on the balance sheet, uh, roughly $60 million in debt uh, with Hercules Capital. And it was crucial to me that we pay off that debt. Um, and it, we progressively did that over the last three years until late last year pay that off. We've also taken steps to... Um, increase the independence of our board um, to the point that today we have a majority independent board uh, with um, representation, importantly, from our largest uh, but uh, having brought on significant new talent onto the board, folks like Senthal Sundaram, who was previously the CFO at Nightstar Therapeutics prior to their acquisition by Biogen, uh, Christina Vori, who leads the uh, Sanford Burnham Institute in San Diego, uh, and sits on the board of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, a real expert um, in gene and cell therapy and tissue-based therapeutics. Um, and so these independent directors have really lent uh, a significant amount of their strategic thinking and vision um, to how we're thinking about the future of the company. Uh, and so that's been invaluable uh, as part of our evolution. And we've diversified the shareholder base as well. Uh, with every financing, uh, our event has been a stalwart supporter um, and we're fortunate to have that support, uh, but has not participated pro rata. And so through the last several financings, uh, we've been able to diversify that shareholder base with new long-term uh, committed investors uh, who also have a real deep understanding of the, the challenges and the opportunities in the gene therapy space. So bringing all of that together uh, was an important focus over the last few years. Um, and then I would finally say uh, the re-domiciliation. So Originally, we were uh, a Bermuda domiciled company, um, and we wanted to make sure that we brought uh, that company back to the U.S., and, and so now we're a more standard Delaware-based company. So a whole set of corporate changes, changes to the cap structure, changes to governance, and, uh, and of course, fundamentally, um, it's a new team, it's a new pipeline, it's a new portfolio strategy uh, that, that looks very different from the accident of the past. Uh, and so we felt the name change was a nice way to encapsulate all of that. Uh, and, and we did that late last year. 
The Business of Biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Dr. Chervon, I, I want to ask you one more one more question about sort of the the pivot, um, and then and then I want to move into uh, the the pipeline itself and get some updates on on what you're working on and progress there. Um, so this is sort of a theor- th- theoretical question. Um, there, obviously, there's been a lot of change. This this uh, this this pivot. Uh, approach has required you to act as sort of an, an architect of that change across several different facets of the organization. So, uh, again, theoretical question, philosophical question, if you will. If you could share with our audience, you know, consider the fact that we're we're talking to uh, the leaders of new and emerging form uh, bi- biotechs in their formative years. If you could share with our audience some advice around how to um, sort of build that nimble DNA into the company from the outset, that, uh, that nimble, adjustable uh, approach, what would that advice be? Yeah, you're hitting on a core, uh, I think, success factor for any nascent company. And that's, you know, from day one, how do you put in place a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship that allows for individuals to act as owners of the business uh, and own the outcome that they're responsible for. Um, And and I think, you know, especially drawing from my experience at Roybent, where previously I'd been the chief people officer and thought a lot about uh, culture across the organization. How do you, how do you have some uh, cohesive thread that links the various parts of a, of a diversified um, and decentralized group, um, you know, that help drive that spirit of innovation um, while also uh, being able to allow uh, the, the CEOs and the management teams at the various events to have a sense of autonomy uh, to, you know, allow them to make their own imprint on the business and to the extent that they want to define culture in their own way to give them the freedom to do that. And I think, you know, that balancing act of, you know, setting the tone with a broad culture that uh, even in the DNA of the organization encourages uh, independent mindedness and, um, and an entrepreneurial spirit uh, is so crucial. And, and so there's a few ways we've approached that. I think um, the first is uh, by, by hiring the right kinds of people. Um, you know, I think we've had the opportunity to grow and scale our organization at a pro- probably a much faster rate than uh, But the reason we haven't is that we apply a very high bar uh, in our hiring process. Uh, we expect folks uh, who interview for roles here to be qualified and experienced to do the job. That's, you know, a prerequisite. But going beyond that, uh, we also look for key, uh, what I would call cultural attributes. And, you know, we've drawn from and learned a lot from uh, the Netflix way, if, if you've read that, you know, a, a value statement by Netflix about uh, encouraging a sense of autonomy and ownership. And, you know, I remember uh, one candidate interviewing for a role at SIO. Uh, and a fairly senior level candidate, he, he walks in and he notices, um, you know, a bit of paint peeling off the wall behind me. And he said to me, um, you know, let's just grab a bucket of paint and we can fix that right now. And, you know, that's exactly the kind of spirit we like to see in our employees that, you know, there's no problem too small. There's no problem that you view as outside of your domain. To the contrary, all of our employees need to have that sense of willingness to roll up their sleeves and tackle uh, any problem that presents itself in the organization. So, so that's, uh, you know, kind of a central feature of how we ensure that that DNA stays right is, uh, is applying that, um, you know, that bar in the hiring process itself. I think another element is aligning incentives appropriately. Uh, and, you know, we think a lot about making sure that people involved in our projects and programs have incentives that are finely tuned and tied to the very outcomes that we desire for the business. Um, so, so those are the two, I mean, this isn't rocket science, but those are kind of the two things that we really focus a lot on. 
Now, this has been an extraordinary year and a challenging year for the entire industry, uh, to mm-hmm. say the least. Um, we've embraced the remote work concept uh, fairly early on. And, you know, something that has been a silver lining for us has been the ability to recruit and hire candidates, not just in the New York metro area in Research Triangle Park, where we have our offices and labs, but really all across the country. And so now we have a geographically much more diverse uh, set of people in the organization. Um, and, you know, I think this goes along with another theme that uh, that I find really important in developing high functioning organizations, and that's diversity of ideas. Um, to, you know, if you want to be challenged and you want to be um, uh, confronted with the best possible ideas, it makes sense to get out of the small insular circles that we often encamp in, right? Whether it's the Boston Cambridge area or the Bay Area uh, or Research Triangle Park, and, and begin to solicit ideas and, and make sure we, uh, we think carefully about these ideas that might originate in, in unexpected places. And so you know, geographic diversity is a small component of that, but something that I've definitely noticed and appreciated over the last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got it. Um, Dr. Cherry, I want to take a minute here and, and pivot about pivot to um, the specific diseases that SIO is working on, and specifically uh, what was the data that SIO announced during ASGCT's recent uh, annual meeting. Uh, so the company announced data about a rare pediatric disease, and it's GM1 gangliosidosis, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. So tell us a little bit about this disease. You know, what causes it and what is SIO doing? And, is you know, why specifically do you think gene therapy is, uh, you know, a good approach to to treat this, like we said, this rare pediatric disease? Yeah, so GM1 ganglocidosis is a monogenic disease. That means it's caused by a single gene defect in a gene called GLB1. A defect in this gene leads to a deficiency of an enzyme, that's the protein product of the gene, called beta-galactosidase. And this enzyme is deficient in every cell in the body. Uh, it's deficient in the brain, but it's also deficient in the heart, uh, skeletal tissue, in Um, and in other tissue beds like the liver. So really throughout the body, you've got this pattern of uh, multi-systemic disease that's progressive, that's inexorably uh, uh, characterized by decline neurologically as well as in other body systems. And, you know, in the most severe forms of the disease, these children have a life expectancy of only two to four years. So, uh, you know, there has been a real uh, need for new therapeutic approaches in GM1 ganglocidosis. And, uh, today, there are no FDA-approved approaches that can modify the course of the disease. The treatment, the standard of care, is currently palliative in nature. Um, so when we looked at this disease in indication, we saw a lot of opportunity to make a difference with gene therapy. And the concept is pretty straightforward. We're using an AAV9-based uh, vector system to, uh, through an intravenous infusion to deliver as its payload the GLB-1 gene that's missing. And, uh, you know, as you may know, AV9 is one of the best studied vector systems on the planet. So earlier in the podcast, I'd mentioned there's over a thousand clinical trials going on for gene therapies. In those trials, nearly 5,000 patients have been dosed to date. And of that, over a thousand uh, have been dosed using AV9. So we understand the biology of AV9. We understand the side effect profile of AV9. Uh, and we understand the potential for efficacy as well. And when it's given intravenously, it really has a shot at making a difference in the body-wide manifestations of this disease. And so where are we with the clinical program? Well, uh, we have, uh, we unlicensed this product from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, This came out of Guang Ping Gao's group. Terry Flott had been the the lead investigator. And we did that back in in, uh, late 2018, December of 2018. At that point, the data generated had been in animal models of disease. And, you know, you'll see lots of examples of conditions in which, um, you know, engineered mouse models can show promise uh, and extraordinary evidence of efficacy. But that doesn't translate when you move into larger animal models of disease. And what we found so compelling was that this gene therapy system had been tested in a natural animal model of disease. And this was actually a colony of felines, of cats, that had been um, 
developed at Auburn over the last 20 years. The team at Auburn had tried a number of different investigational approaches. None of them really worked well uh, until this gene therapy was tried. And the results were, um, were extremely compelling to the point of restoring wild type survival and stabilizing uh, neurobehavioral function in these animals many years after one-time dosing therapy. And so our goal with the development program is really to capture uh, some measure of the benefit that we've seen in the feline model of disease uh, and demonstrate that in the first children who are being dosed, uh, but to place our priority on safety and tolerability. We've got to make sure that this can be delivered safely. Uh, and, and so the design of the phase one, two's trial focuses principally on safety and tolerability. In addition to that, we capture biomarkers. So specifically, we look at GM1 ganglioside, which is the toxic substrate that starts to accumulate in cells when the enzyme is deficient. So we can measure that in the CSF. And what we reported at ASGCT uh, just a couple of weeks ago is that we saw meaningful declines in GM1 ganglioside in CSF of four out of the five children who received dosing. And this was paired with evidence of clinical disease stabilization on multiple measures, uh, as well as a, a, a really nice safety and tolerability profile. So that combination of factors uh, makes us very excited about the future of the program. And we're continuing to dose patients in a higher dose cohort now. So that's a threefold higher dose than, uh, than the children dosed previously, as well as moving into, into even younger patients with uh, early infantile or type 1 uh, form of the disease. That's the most severe uh, manifestation of GM1 ganglocytosis. Awesome. So you're, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Do Dr. Cheravu, can you can you kind of dig into how you're going about measuring or assessing the efficacy of the drug? I know you just touched on it as you were wrapping up there, but can you give us a little more detail on, on how that is accomplished? Yeah, so there's two uh, big buckets of, of measures that we look at. Um, the first are standard neurodevelop neurodevelopmental scales. These are well-validated scales that have been used in a number of trials before and that are used to follow uh, children, either young infants or uh, up to juvenile children. So the scale that we've been using uh, is called the Vineland 3 scale. It's a multi-part uh, scale that includes a number of components like for example, receptive and expressive communication. Uh, and that's, you know, those are two of the subdomains on, on this multi-part scale. We also look at uh, the CGI or clinician's global impression. And this is a, um, a several point scale where clinicians assess subjectively uh, whether they think the patient is doing better or worse uh, than they were at the start of the trial at baseline. Uh, we also uh, use as additional measures, mobility scales. And then we look at neurologic exam and, you know, these binary measures of development. So, for instance, can a child move a ball from one hand to another? Can a child sit upright independently? These kinds of measures uh, provide yes or no answers as to whether or not a child is able to hit those standard um, uh, milestones during normal healthy childhood development. The other bucket of measures uh, has to do with biomarkers to assess efficacy. Now, uh, you know, FDA has recently put out a draft guidance around the use of biomarkers in, um, in neurological studies of gene therapies and in rare diseases. Uh, and what we understand is that if you can show evidence of clinical stabilization following gene therapy and then pair that with biomarker evidence that you're having the intended biochemical effect with your gene therapy, well, that's a powerful combination. And that combination can lead you um, to think uh, about getting this product to patients potentially sooner than otherwise possible if you didn't have the biomarker. And so we care a lot about biomarker development. Uh, we've invested tremendous resource, uh, both internally and working with external CROs uh, in the validation and qualification of key biomarker assays. And there's really two things that uh, we focused on in our study. Uh, one is looking at the enzyme itself in serum. So Beta-galactosidase has certain activity, and you can assay that activity in serum. And what we saw, roughly speaking, was a doubling of enzyme activity uh, at the six-month mark um, after administration of uh, gene therapy. What we also saw um, uh, related to that is uh, measuring the, the end product, the substrate, uh, in that pathway. So this is GM1 ganglioside that I was referring to earlier. This is the toxic substrate that 
uh, that accumulates within lysosomes of cells. And when it accumulates too much, that can ultimately lead to cell death and degeneration. So you can measure GM1 ganglicide uh, in CSS, and we've done that uh, at the six-month mark, uh, again, in four out of the five patients, seeing um, evidence of decline uh, ranging up to 49% uh, in one of the patients. So again, very promising uh, levels of reduction paired with increases in enzyme activity that we're seeing. Nice. So regarding the GM1 clinical trial specifically, so the Washington Post wrote an article, I think it was last year, uh, about SIO's team and NIH bringing a family from Sweden to the U.S. to participate in your GM1 clinical trial. So can you talk to us a little bit about what happened, you know, what the results of that are? Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, happy to share more about that. So, you know, we're running a, a global trial. Uh, we have one site, uh, and that's the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, but we uh, recruit and screen patients from all over the world. And uh, early last year, just as the COVID pandemic uh, was, was taking hold here in the U.S., we had a, a family from Sweden. They have three young children, um, all of whom uh, have been diagnosed with GM1 ganglicidosis who uh, we screened for eligibility in the trial. And the challenge that was presented to the team was that, uh, you know, and this, this sounds so, you know, operational and tactical, but it, these are the realities of running clinical trials. Um, you know, back in, in March and April of last year, the family simply couldn't get uh, a travel visa mm -hmm. that would permit them to come to the U.S. And um, in, due to the pandemic. And so, you know, we worked in a really creative fashion uh, with the families um, and, you know, and, and also with the State Department and other groups uh, within the NIH um, to make sure that um, every obstacle that had presented itself, uh, you know, could be tackled and could be addressed such that this family could come to the U.S. Uh, under a special authorization, um, be housed in Bethesda for a period of time while the, uh, the children received standard immunosuppression got the gene therapy and then could be followed for a period of time afterwards, all in the midst of a raging pandemic. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of, of the efforts of our team and of NIH to make this a reality for, for the family. I think, um, you know, it's an obligation in, in my view, it's a moral imperative that companies really invest in uh, making that white glove service possible uh, for families uh, who really have no other option today, right? This is, uh, this trial um, obviously, you know, presents some element of hope to the families. Um, and although it is an investigational product, you know, we want to make sure that patients who are screened and who are indeed eligible have every opportunity to participate in the trial uh, if it's possible. That's an extraordinary effort. We, uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, the, the Life Science Connect family that uh, that that Gene dot com and BioprocessOnline.com are a part of includes a, a site called Clinical Leader, and uh, you know, obviously, that site is dedicated to covering uh, the clinical aspects of of uh, drug development, and. Um, you know, they there there are a lot of stories about uh, creativity in uh, in the execution of clinical trials. That that one uh, would be uh, would be a terrific one. I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna turn on our our editor on that site to, uh, to your company, Dr. Cherubu. That's an incredible story. Congratulations on making it happen. Oh, th thank you. And you know, I think really the the thanks goes to the the entire teams that were involved in uh, making this a reality. Yeah. Uh, we are so we're running a bit short on time here. So, I, but but I want to make sure that we talk about uh, some manufacturing challenges before we before we wrap things up. And I'm I'm curious. I, I know that you know you've got uh, several uh, programs, as you mentioned, AAV programs, lentiviral programs uh, on the docket. Um, but I want to talk generally about uh, manufacturing challenges uh, that that you've faced or that you perhaps anticipate facing as you move uh, a little closer to. Uh, you know, com commercial stage scale up, um, or, or clinical for that matter, as clinical programs grow. This is a very complex, obviously, uh, space that, that we're working in. What are some of the unique, I guess, manufacturing challenges that that SIO is, has faced, and, and how are you overcoming them? Yeah, so currently we have a hybrid manufacturing strategy. What that means is that we have in-house teams that work on aspects of analytical development, 
and process development. And as our uh, processes are, are developed in-house, we want to have that capability of transferring that process uh, into external CDMOs uh, who can then uh, produce and manufacture the product in, um, in their own bioreactors in GMP suites. Mm-hmm. And this hybrid uh, relationship, you know, I, I think is sufficient for our needs today, for meeting the needs of our ongoing clinical trials. But as we think about the future, uh, one of the core elements or pillars of our strategy going forward is, is to begin thinking about that pathway to in-house manufacturing where we can have uh, an, an ability to produce and manufacture at scale uh, in-house. Now, one of the crucial challenges that we've had uh, relative, I think, to many other companies that might exclusively focus on rare diseases is that we're trying to tackle uh, Parkinson's disease as one of our indications. Now, this is a disease that impacts uh, several million patients around the world about a million patients in the U.S. alone. And if we're successful, you know, we need to be able to produce this at scale. Um, and so we recognize early on that it's not enough to have uh, a process that, you know, per batch can manufacture a few dozen doses, right? That's not going to work. We really need to have the ability to scale up uh, to the thousands or even hundreds of thousands of doses by the time we reach commercial scale. And we also recognize that in the process of development, it's a good idea to have a a commercial process or something similar close to a commercial process being used as part of your phase two and phase three development. Uh, And so we've taken on uh, a big effort, uh, both internally and in cooperation with our uh, partner, Oxford Biomedica, uh, who's based out in the UK, um, to develop a new kind of process for uh, lentiviral uh, vector manufacturing that can achieve the kinds of scale that we're talking about. Um, and so, you know, where we are uh, right now as we look across our programs is that evolution from a hybrid model, in which we do some of the work in-house but are very reliant on external CDMOs uh, for manufacturing and production uh, to a model uh, in which over time uh, we have more control over quality, cost, and timeline. That's super interesting. Um, and, and just a quick follow-up to that, you know, I, I, I think we, we've run into several stories where, uh, you know, we we interview folks from the cell and gene community who are developing uh, in-house until they can outsource, and and it looks like that sort of you, your approach is a little bit, uh, you know, f- flipping that um, on its ear. Do, do you do you see that commonly? Is that is that something that you think is unique to to Sio's approach? You know, I, I would say right now the field is mixed. Uh, you know, there are some companies that have taken on an approach of in-house manufacturing. Uh, and there are some companies that are adopting more of a CDMO approach uh, exclusively. And, and I think the, um, you know, a good analogy here could be looking at monoclonal antibodies and the evolution of yields and efficiency over time for mm-hmm. monoclonal antibodies. You know, if you look back, um, you know, back to the, the 80s and then moving, you know, marching forward every decade beyond that, um, monoclonal antibodies have gotten progressively cheaper uh, less expensive um, to produce, but also the ability to produce more reliably, right, where there's less batch-to-batch variability. And, mm-hmm. and I think that um, is a similar kind of trend that you'll see in the gene and cell therapy space. And really, I think the question comes down to um, how early stage are your products, right? If you have discovery stage products and you're not anticipating reaching commercial uh, scale until, you know, for six or seven years from now, Well, you know, the field might be able to evolve in that period of time to a point where you can actually be fully reliant on CDMOs. I think in our case, you know, if we're successful, uh, we would have products uh, potentially approved by FDA much sooner than that. And uh, and so we really need to prepare ourselves to rapidly advance these programs through the latter stages of clinical development uh, and then be fully prepared to commercialize these uh, as well. And, and I think that's where um, in-house manufacturing uh, can take on greater importance. Very cool. Nice. Dr. Cheravu, one last question before we let you go. What's next for Cyogene Therapies? So I, the way I look at the future of Cyo, it, it's very bright. You know, we have now put in place the building blocks for long-term success that I described earlier, team capabilities portfolio. And, you know, what I think a lot about these days is how do we grow and scale? Uh, Because I think we've got a 50-person team that's capable of tackling uh, more than just the three portfolio products we have today and 
potentially uh, you know, adding several more products into our pipeline could be a key element of our strategy. But in short, there's really four pillars to our strategy right now. Uh, the first is execute on the existing pipeline. Uh, we think that there is tremendous value to be unlocked for patients and for shareholders if we simply execute uh, and march towards next steps with the Parkinson's, GM1, and TASACS programs. Um, second is looking opportunistically for uh, opportunities to in-license uh, new technologies, new products um, that build in our existing franchises of rare pediatric disease and adult neurodegenerative diseases, but perhaps also build in new verticals in other therapeutic areas. Um, third, we are looking for uh, platform scientific platform expansion. So continuing to build out that laboratory space in North Carolina and add into it novel IP around novel technology platforms that could help us originate not one, but a multitude of new gene therapies over time. Uh, and then the fourth pillar is what we just talked about, uh, the evolution towards uh, greater control over manufacturing and building out of uh, in-house manufacturing over time. Dr. Cheravu, I, I appreciate it. Thank you for indulging our questions. Um, I, I, we've, I feel as though we've abused your time. We've gone long. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've, we, we could continue talking, I'm sure, uh, all, all day. Uh, but, uh, but I appreciate the time that you've spent with us, and I, I thank you for indulging our questions. It's been a real honor. Really enjoyed the conversation, Matt and Aaron. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. So that's Syogene Therapy CEO, Dr. Pavan Cheruvu, and Cell and Gene Chief Editor, Aaron Harris. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced for you, the leaders of emerging biopharma companies by Bioprocess Online, in partnership with Cytiva, which I encourage you to explore at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Be sure to also visit bioprocessonline.com and sellandgene.com to subscribe to the newsletters that Aaron and I procure for you. And if you're liking the conversations we have, subscribe to the pod, give us five stars, and share us with your colleagues. Thanks for listening.